I'd like for you to open up your Bibles tonight. We're in Route 66, as you can tell from all of our items down here below. I'm still, I'm still working on getting that uh, 1957 Corvette out here. And uh, we're hopefully going to get that before we finish this series. But we are taking a road trip through the Bible, and uh, we're glad you're a part of this. Tonight, I want you to open up to the book of Titus. Tonight, the book of Titus in the New Testament. Is there anybody who's never heard of the book of Titus? Okay, it's a lot of people are like, is that even in the Bible? And Titus is a little three-chapter book that is one of Paul's writings. And uh, I know what you're thinking, only three chapters. Good night, we ought to be done in plenty of time. <laughs> and you all know as well as I do, it really means nothing, doesn't it? So if you've been with us, we started in Genesis uh, many, many months ago, and we've been walking through every Wednesday night except for a few, uh, one book of the Bible every Wednesday night. We are now in what we call the Pauline epistles. These are the letters of the Apostle Paul. And as I've shared with you, all of these books, Romans, Corinthians, Colossians, Galatians, Ephesians, all of these Pauline epistles, and just to help you understand, these all flow out of the book of Acts. Okay, so understand the book of Acts records Paul's missionary will. It records the early church, but then when Paul got saved and he serves as a missionary um, to that part of the world, and then as he traveled, he wrote these letters to mostly churches, but to, to Timothy and Titus, which we're going to look at tonight, he wrote to individuals. Now, these books, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, are what we call pastoral epistles. So Paul trained Timothy as a young pastor, and he also trained Titus to be an overseer of a church that we're going to talk about in a moment. And I know some people say, well... These books are irrelevant today. This was written many years ago, and it doesn't really apply to us today. Let me explain something. The Word of God is just as good for us today as it was for them. Okay? It hasn't changed. And do you know what I've discovered after 57 very short years of life? Do you know what I've discovered? People haven't changed People have not changed, right? The things that we, listen, the things that we deal with today, they dealt with then because people haven't changed. We say, oh, it's so bad today. Listen, you go back into the Old Testament and it was just as bad then. You know why? Because we're fallen human beings and we're all in need of the grace of God. So when someone says we don't need the books of the Bible anymore, let me give you a truth tonight. These letters or these books that we're studying are not only are they inspired of God, they are the instruction manuals for the church today. Church, if we didn't, listen, if we didn't have this, we would be making up the rules as we go, right? And sadly, that's what's happening in a lot of places. Churches are making up the rules as they go. This is our handbook. This is our instruction manual. And Titus, even though it's only three chapters, Titus is an incredibly important book for the church. And we're going to call this lesson tonight, Setting Things in Order. Setting Things in Order. And as you're writing that, how many know God is a God of order? And I've used this analogy over and over again. Uh, it's not an analogy, it's life. Um, the Bible says God is not the author of confusion, but a God of peace. Let all things be done decently and in order. 
And so we've talked about God created the universe with an order to it, right? There's a sun and the moon. There are nine planets. They all orbit, and everything is in sync. It's the way God intended it to be. How many would agree with me that if any one of the nine planets got out of its orbit, we would have, we would have problems, <laughs> especially if it was Earth, okay? So God created the universe with order. If you go back to Genesis and you study uh, the days of creation, it all had order to it, okay? Everybody with me? Okay, government. As much as government has its problems, government is created with an order to it. And with that order, you have peace and stability. But we all understand when government gets out of order, what does it create in society? It creates chaos and confusion. Are you, are you with me? The family. God created, do you believe God created the family? Absolutely. And God created the family with an order. The husband, the man, he submits to God, loves his family. The wife submits to her husband. The children submit to their parents. If you have that order, guess what you have? You have peace and harmony in the home. But if any one of those gets out of order, if the husband doesn't want to submit to God, doesn't want to love his family, you're going to have chaos and confusion. And he's probably going to be sleeping in the doghouse. If the wife doesn't want to submit to her husband and doesn't want to fulfill her role as a godly mother to her children, I mean, no, it, there's going to be chaos and confusion. And okay, parents, let me hear you. When the children don't want to obey their parents, you got problems. Okay? So my point is, Wherever there is order, there is peace. But when things get out of order, you have chaos and confusion. Well, guess what? The church also has an order. The church, some people believe the church should be a place where you can go do anything you want. We all just love one another. Just love, love, love. Just do whatever you want because we love one another. You want to lie, cheat, and steal? We just love one another. Okay, no. The church was ordained by God. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church. So, so the church was established by God, not man. And the church should have order, right? And when there's order in the church, you have peace in the church. But when things get out of order in the church, that's what brings chaos and confusion. So this all, you say, what am I getting this introduction for? This has everything to do with what Titus is going to have to deal with in uh, Paul's letter to Titus. So I want you to look at Titus chapter 1, verse number 1, and we're going to read down um, into verse number 5 tonight. So it says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which is according to godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, I love this, who cannot lie, turn to your neighbor and say, God doesn't lie, who promised before time began, but as in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Watch verse 5. For this reason, I left you in Crete. Everyone say Crete. That you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. So this is Paul's instruction manual to a young man by the name of Timothy or Titus. Titus is the third pastoral epistle from Paul. Now, if you want to get real specific, Titus time-wise actually fits between 1st and 2nd Timothy. But when they compiled the Bible, they put 1st and 2nd Timothy together. 
So Titus is Paul's apostolic representative on the island of Crete. Does anybody know right off the top of your head where the island of Crete is? Some of you? It's, off, it's a part of the Greek. Uh, it's a part of Greece. Let me show you on the map. Um, so this first map, um, here is Jerusalem down here. Here is Asia Minor, what is now modern-day Turkey. There's Greece, Macedonia. There's Athens and Corinth. And right down here is the island of Crete. As a matter of fact, if you follow that line, that was when Paul traveled to Rome, recorded in Acts 27, um, where they sailed by Crete. There, there is a lot of speculation as to when Paul planted this church on the island of Crete, and we're not going to get into that speculation tonight. But there is the island of Crete. As a matter of fact, I, Crete is it's one of the Greek islands, but it's not a little island by any means. It is approximately 150 miles long, and it's anywhere from 7 to 30 miles uh, wide in its widest place. Go to the next slide. Um, this is more of an aerial map. So here is Greece right up here. Here's Turkey, Macedonia. But here is the island of Crete right there in the Mediterranean Sea. You can tell it's a pretty good-sized island, isn't it? Okay, let's go to one more slide. I saw this and I thought, I want to go. Anybody else want to go to Crete? That's a beautiful place. Uh, that is one of the bays uh, off the Mediterranean Sea, but that's the island of, of Crete. That's a portion of it, by the way. That's not obviously the whole thing. Very interesting. You see that mountaintop right there? Can you tell there's snow up there? That's crazy. Kind of like Mount Lemon in a way. Um, matter of fact, uh, they, those who, who bought into Greek mythology and all of that, they believe that Zeus, uh, the, the, the made-up god, they believe that he was born on top of that mountain right there. So Crete kind of has an interesting history. And Paul planted the church there and then later sent Titus back to Crete because things needed to be get set in order. You say, well, why was that important? Well, the island of Crete was a pretty rough place back in the day. Uh, matter of fact, turn over, if you will, uh, to, to verse number 12. And Paul actually quotes an old saying about those who lived in Crete. He said, one of them, a prophet of their own, said, now, how would you like to have this reputation? Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And that's, that was the island of Crete. There was some interesting characteristics about the island. Number one, they were immoral. Number two, they were lazy and gluttonous. They were also very contentious and rebellious. So it was almost like a, just a rough, rough, rough place to be. So you can imagine, everybody say with me, Paul plants a church there. People are getting saved. But how many of you know it's a rough crowd. And so you have these people coming into the church who are lazy, gluttonous, immoral, contentious, argumentative. And Paul realizes, if I don't get somebody in there to straighten this out, this is going to be a mess. Okay? And that is the backdrop of why Titus went to the island of Crete. Now, I only have two points tonight, all right? All right, point number one, Paul is going to deal with what I call the protection of sound doctrine. The protection of sound doctrine. When we talk about sound doctrine, we are talking about healthy doctrines. Does that make sense? We are talking about safe teaching, all right? How many know not every doctrine out there is sound or safe? So... Paul says, Titus, I'm sending you to Crete because you need to protect the sound doctrine that the church is built on. And that's really what chapter 1 is all about. There are two things that, that come underneath this. Number one, executing order in the church. Okay? If, if you don't get order in the church, you will get chaos, won't you? 
Okay? So follow along in verse number 5. Paul said, for this reason, Titus, this is why I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine, there it is, both to exhort and convict those who contradict. So let's take this passage and let's talk about what Paul wants to get across. As with any new church plant, there are always dangers with immaturity and instability. And remember, the island of Crete was, was a little bit of a rough crowd. So it is important and imperative that Titus gets some order lest it gets out of control. Can anybody say amen? If you put a, a, a 32 two-year-olds in a room together with no adult, what's going to happen? It's going to get real bad real fast, okay? So Titus, you need to get in there and you need to appoint some godly leadership. Here's, here's, here's something, church. Without sound leadership, the church becomes open to chaos and confusion. Amen? And, and let me teach you something if you don't already know this. Wherever you have chaos and confusion, you will have demonic activity. Satan thrives in an atmosphere of confusion. Satan breeds where there is chaos and confusion. That's really where he can get a stronghold is when there's no order. Can I get an amen? And so Paul begins to lay out the qualities of any kind of spiritual leader. He uses the word bishop, which is an overseer or technically a pastor, but it's any kind of spiritual leadership. I want you to go back to verse 6, and I want you to notice, this isn't going to be on the screen, y'all, but there are three primary categories of qualities. Number one is a sound family. He said this man must be blameless, verse 6, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. In other words, a true spiritual leader needs to have his family in order. And you remember what Paul told Timothy? If a man can't control his own house, how can he rule the house of God? Amen. How many have ever, how many grew up in a day where it was always the preacher's kids were always the worst? It, there's a lot of truth to that, unfortunately. And of course, the preacher's kids say well, the reason we're that way is we learned everything from the deacon's kids. But Paul, and I think it's something that's, that's, that should be addressed more seriously, that any kind of pastor or spiritual leader, they need to demonstrate that they can lead their own family first. Come on. They need to demonstrate that they have the leadership qualities First in your home, because if you can't do it in your home, you'll never qualify to do it in the house of God. Okay? And so number one, there was to have a sound family. Number two is they needed to have a sound personal temperament. They needed to have a sound personal temperament. He said in verse 7, a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, in other words, he doesn't have his own selfish agenda, not quick-tempered. He doesn't get ticked off easy. All right? Everybody say amen. Not given to wine, shouldn't be out drinking. Come on. Not violent. Boy, that's a good one. <laughs> not greedy for money. How many would agree in this day and age of money-loving preachers, we need to get back to that? But hospitable, a lover of what is good, 
sober-minded, just wholly self-controlled. In other words, a man has got to be able to maintain character and integrity in the ministry. Come on. And then number three, he's got to have sound doctrine. The man needs to know the Bible. He needs to be taught in the Word of God. He said in verse 9, holding fast the faithful Word as he has been taught. So the, the point I want to make in all of this, let me put this up on the screen. If the head is not healthy, the body will not be healthy. And so it is in any organization, if the leadership is not healthy, the church will eventually fall the same way. Can I get an amen? So Paul says, Titus, you get there. You need to begin to start straightening these things out. You don't just put anybody in leadership. They need to be healthy spiritually in their family and in their own temperament. Amen? And then Paul, in verse number 10, addresses point number two, and that is exposing offenders in the church. So number one, we need to execute order. We need to get the right leadership in. We need to get the right people with the right character, healthy at the top. But now we need to deal with those in the church who are causing problems. Um, before I get into this, Jesus says something in Matthew 7 that I think is worth going back to. In the Sermon on the Mount, I want you to listen to what Jesus said. He said, beware of false prophets. Y'all believe there's false prophets out there? Absolutely. Who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. He said, many will say in the day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And Jesus said that I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. <sighs> Let me share something with you tonight. Not everyone in the church belongs to the church. And I'm not talking about whether you're a member or not. Maybe a better way to say it is not everyone in the church is of the church. Are you with me? Now, I'm not talking about y'all. So don't, don't get up mad. But not everyone has good motives. Not everyone has good intentions. I'm, I'm convinced there are people that Satan inspires to go in to cause trouble in the church. I'm fully convinced of that. Some are what we call wolves in sheep's clothing. They are disguised, as Paul says, as angels of light. They are false teachers and false prophets. Well, how do you identify them? Well, look at verse number 10. Paul gives some things to look at. Paul said, for there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. And he's talking about Jewish people here whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Their testimony, this testimony is true. Therefore, Paul said, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. So let me give you some characteristics. Again, it's not going to be on the screen, so you have to write this down. How can you identify the true from the false or false from the true? Well, number one, these troublemakers, these offenders, number one, are insubordinate. They are in subordinate. That's what Paul says in verse 10. For there are many insubordinate. What does that mean? Well, 
They have no respect nor any regard for spiritual leadership. They willfully and purposefully resist and oppose the leadership God has placed in them. Does that make sense? They, they will not listen. They will not obey. They will not submit. They want to do their own thing. That is a mark. That is a mark of a false prophet or teacher. It is a mark of a troublemaker. Amen? And this is not in any way trying to elevate myself or to say that we're not without need of correction. Please don't misunderstand me. But there are some people that come in and they're not going to regard any kind of leadership. Those are the people you have to deal with. Number two, they're gossipers. Now, how many glad we don't, we don't gossip anymore? Paul said they are both idle talkers. That's gossip. They talk about things they shouldn't talk about. They spread rumors and heresy. And they, they actually will affect entire households. They are argumentative. And they stir up people everywhere they go. That, listen, you get around somebody who's stirring people up, you need to get away from them. Okay? That, that, that's not the spirit of Christ. Okay? So they are insubordinate. They are, they are uh, gossipers. Number three, they're deceptive. They are incredibly deceptive. Paul said they are deceivers. They're deceptive in what they say. They appear spiritual, but they're empty of any true spirituality. I, I wrote this down. They look spiritual. They sound spiritual, but they're spiritually bankrupt. And Paul said you got to be on guard, and you need to identify them. Come on. Amen. And then one last thing is they're greedy. They are greedy. He said, for the sake of dishonest gain. They are greedy for money. They are greedy for attention. They are greedy for fame. They are greedy for self-image. Um, All of these things. Church, the, the church of Jesus Christ is not about us. It's about him. And I don't mean that we don't love one another. We care for one another. We, we support one another. But church, we cannot make it about us. It's always got to be about Jesus. Can I get an amen? Now look at verse 15, because there's something here that for years I, I wanted to understand, and now I do. In verse 15, Paul said, To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and their conscience is defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him. Being abominable, disobedient, disqualified, very good. I always wondered, what was Paul trying to say? To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are not pure, everything is defiled. Let me explain this. People who have a pure heart are not always looking for fault in others. Let me say this again. People who have a pure heart they don't go around looking for fault in everyone else. People with a pure heart do not take offense at everything people say. They don't constantly get offended over every little thing. Come on. People who have a pure heart, they don't even think like that. They get along with others well. They're not argumentative and contentious. Can I get an amen? To the pure, all things are pure. They don't live in that world of contamination and corruption. However, those who are defiled, nothing is pure. And I thought, what does that mean? And I, I'm going to do the best I can. These kind of people, and you're not one of them, all right? At least you better not be. These people, no matter how hard you try to reason with them, they refuse to listen. No matter, no matter how hard you try to be logical, um, to, to, to work with them, they have an agenda that is contrary to Christ. And so no matter what you do, you, you'll never be able to make peace with these people. Why? Because their agenda is wrong. Their heart is, come on, you know, we have a joke in the ministry that there are some people, if you walked on water for them, they'd get mad that you didn't go far enough. 
that no matter what you do, it's never good enough. Let me tell you, those kinds of people, they do not have the heart of Christ. Amen? They are resistant to counsel. They are resistant to correction. They are re- Someone said they're resistant to common sense. They say they know God, but you look at their life, they don't know God at all. And Paul said, these are the kinds of people you got to deal with. And you have to deal with them because the Bible says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Amen? Titus has got his work cut out for him. He's got to walk into this church and he's got to begin to set things in order and straighten things out. And first off the bat is to protect sound doctrine. Amen? All right. Let me go to point number two and we're done. Maybe. By the way, by the way, um, the Bible describes the role of a pastor as that of a shepherd. And there, th- this is a side note. There are four primary responsibilities of a shepherd. Number one, feed the flock of God. That's one of my roles is to feed the flock. And I know I feed you with both barrels, don't I? I feed you the whole thing. Number two is to lead the flock. A shepherd never drives Shepherd leads the flock. Number three, cares for the flock. It's there in their time of need. Number four, and a lot of people forget this, part of my job is to guard or protect the flock. A shepherd, when you study the old sheepfolds, the shepherd, not only did he know his sheep by name, right? A shepherd should know the name of his sheep. Now you understand. And we work really hard at that. If I can't think of your name, I call you brother or sister. But a shepherd loves his flock and he'll protect them. And at night, the shepherd would sleep in the doorway of the sheepfold so that number one, the sheep don't get out, but number two, the wolves don't get in. And there are times the shepherd has to stand up and tell the wolf, you will not come here. And that sounds harsh, but sometimes we do that because we have to protect the, the ministry. Can I get an amen? amen. And so that's, that's what we do. All right. Number two is what I call the practice of sound doctrine. And we're just going to roll through this fairly quickly tonight. Chapter two and three really deal with the practical side of Christianity. Paul lives, moves now into the lives of the members of the flock. And what they truly believe is going to be manifested in how they behave. And I think that's true for us today. Number one, what we truly believe will affect how we behave. Can I get an amen? Someone said doctrine adorns duty and duty adorns doctrine. The two are intricately woven together and they can't be separated. How we live tells the world what we believe. Number one, Paul deals with the qualities of godly saints. The qualities of godly saints. Now this is going to be very just right down the line, but Paul is going to systematically break down each segment of the congregation and say, this is what you're called to be. Number one, look at verse one, chapter two. Everyone still awake? Paul said to Titus, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. In other words, for Titus and those in leadership, it is imperative that they speak sound doctrine, that they speak scripture, Bible teaching. Amen. Now notice verse two. Now here's where he's going to break it down. Number one, the older men. Now, how many glad he didn't say old men? Come on, say amen. He said older men. Paul's not stupid. He said, men, you should be sober. And that doesn't mean non-drunk. It means self-controlled. You are to be reverent, temperate, sound, in faith, in love, and in patience. Older men, God calls you 
to be men of integrity, men of self-control, men who are solid in your faith. And come on, amen. Amen. Men, God needs you. He needs you to be real men, men of character, men of control. Who is a sermon? Men of character, men of control, men of compassion. Just throwing it out there. Ladies, you're next. He didn't say old women. Verse 3, he said older women. Likewise. Now notice what he says. You are to be reverent in behavior. Let me just, ladies, I love you, but don't be obnoxious. Ladies, don't be obnoxious. Don't be a loud mouth, or as Sheila say, don't be a big mouth frog. <laughs> ladies, you are called to be reverent in your behavior, not slanderers. You know what that means? Don't be a gossip. Ladies, don't be a gossip. Come on. If it doesn't involve you, don't you be talking about it. If you don't know all the facts, shut up. Thank you, ladies. Not giving to much wine. Quit your drinking. Be teachers of good ladies. You are such an example to our younger girls. Amen? Be teachers of good things. Look at verse 4. That they admonish the young women. So you have a great responsibility, ladies, to be an example to the younger ladies in the church. Just like the older men are an example to the younger men. But ladies, behave yourself as is becoming of a true lady. Can I get an amen? All right. Are you ready for the next one? Younger women. Now that's anybody under 90. Verse number 4. He said, younger women, love your husbands. And all the men said, thank you, men. Love your children. Ladies, that's your first priority is to love your husbands, love your children. Verse number five, be discreet, which means be self-controlled. Behave yourself with beauty. Be chaste, which is modest in behavior and dress. Let me just say this and get it off my chest. If you are an older woman, quit trying to be a 20-year-old. Is that okay? Thank you. I got my amen corner right over here. The rest of you, the rest of you are like... If you are an older woman, quit trying to flaunt yourself like some young thing. Be who God made you to be. Come on. And younger women, be controlled. Be modest. He said be homemakers. And I know that we live in an economy where many of our women have to work. But your priority should be the health of your home. Amen? He goes on to say that, uh, that you may be, oh, oh, oh. He says be good and be obedient to your own husbands. Mm, boy, that got quiet understanding in the Lord, right? In other words, lady, young lady, my goodness, you have a great responsibility of the way you conduct yourself, the way you present yourself is so important to the body of Christ. Amen? All right, younger men, are you ready? Verse number six, younger men, you are to be sober-minded. Means you're to have, I, I looked this up. It means you're to have sound judgment. You are to be sensible. And then it says you're to be sane. <laughs> You are to be sane. How many believe we need some sane young men? Because let me tell you, I've seen plenty of insane. Amen. He says in verse 7, you are to show yourself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be, talk right, talk with respect. Amen. Sound speech that cannot be Condemned. And then verse number nine. Now, this is a little bit tough, but in those days, slavery was common. And Paul is not endorsing slavery in any way, but it was a fact of life in those days. And so Paul recognizes servants. Now, today, we can, we can and put in the word employees, okay? He said, be obedient 
to your own masters. In other words, you do what you're told. With, I mean, as long as it's legal, can I get an amen? All right? And then he says, and I want to really touch on something here. He said, be well pleasing in all things, not answering back. Now, what's he talking about here? If you, let me just talk about those of you that have jobs tonight. Okay, those of you that are employees at a place of business. Christians ought to be the best employees in the world. You do what you're told without arguing back. Okay, one of the worst things you could say in this place is that's not on my job description. Okay? You ought to show up to work on time. You ought to be willing to go the extra mile. Quit being argumentative with your boss and the other employees. Don't get involved in office drama. Christians, you are to be different in the workplace. And then in verse number 10, not pilfering. How many know what pilfering is? Don't be a thief. Don't steal things from the workplace. Can I get an amen? And then he says, showing all good honesty that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. Let me, let me wrap this up, y'all. Here is the truth tonight. Your behavior and your attitude will either compel unbelievers or repel unbelievers. Your behavior and your attitude in the world, in the marketplace, will either compel unbelievers, in other words, draw them in, or it will repel unbelievers. They don't want anything to do with the church because of you. Amen? And, and, and let me tell you where it starts. In the home. There are a lot of children who grew up with either a mom or dad or both who are constantly criticizing the church and then wonder why their kids have no heart for God. You want to know why? Because they listen to your gossip, not you as a choke. Okay. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, not you. But they, they listen to you complain and you criticize the church and you criticize the pastor, and you criticize the members and you criticize the music and you criticize the seats and you criticize the air conditioning. You know what I'm saying? Some people have chicken for lunch. Some families have preacher for lunch. And your kids grew up listening to it and it has repelled them away from the faith. On the job, the way you act at work, your attitude says so much about who you are and what you believe in the community. And then just go down to verse number 12. Paul once again calls us to a place of godliness. He said, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you believe he's coming again? Then we ought to live like it, amen? Let me give you one more verse and we're almost done. In 2 Corinthians 7, this is for us tonight. Paul said, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Church, we cannot afford to become like the world we live in. Amen. We as believers, we are called to a higher standard because of the grace of God. So, number one, the qualities of godly saints. Lastly, we're done. The qualities of godly saints citizens. And this is great timing for this with the elections coming up. Chapter 3 is a reminder of our responsibility as citizens of the nation and community in which we live. Verse number 1, remind them. Now remember, those who lived on Crete were rebellious. They didn't listen to authority. He said, you are to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey and be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. Listen, there's a lot of things about America I don't like, but I still have a responsibility as a child of God and as a citizen to obey the laws of the land. I have a responsibility, though I may not agree with our leadership, 
I still have a responsibility to regard and respect the office in our, in our land. Come on. We are not called to be trusted. Let, let me, let me. I want to be careful here, but I got to say it. Several years ago, we saw all of this rioting going on in our cities. People complaining about government and injustice and all of this while they're burning our cities to the ground. Listen, Christians are not to be a part of that kind of stuff. We are not to partake. We vote, we pray, we be salt and light, but we are not called to violence. Can I get an amen? amen. Let, me, let me say it this way. We are not to become like the culture we live in. We are to be light and salt in a dark and decaying world. That's who we are. Let me put it the way Peter put it. 1 Peter chapter 2. He said, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Church, my prayers, I close this out tonight for Titus. My prayer is that we will never, that we'll never forget. Church, we are here to make a difference for the kingdom of God. We are here to go to work and be an example. We are here to help lead others to our faith in Christ. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't be a troublemaker. And sadly, as we have our musicians come, sadly, sometimes Christians are their own worst enemy. By their words, by their attitude, and by their actions, we can do more damage to the cause of Christ. So, we close out tonight. I didn't even finish all of it. There's some great words in here. But wherever God has placed us, whether it's in leadership here or in your home or in the community or wherever you are, may we truly shine as Christians in the world in which we live. May we shine at home as godly men and women, godly husbands and godly wives. May we shine at work as salt and light, showing the difference. May we shine in the community. And may we shine at the church that we are the family of God. Amen? Amen. Are you glad we're done? Come on, it's all right. Say amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Stand together if you will. Would you take the hand of the person next to you tonight? Lord, I realize that these books of the Bible are often overlooked. But man, Lord, this thing hits us right where we live. A reminder of what we are called to. I thank you for the family of God. And we know that we have flaws. We know that we have faults. But you have, you have called us for such a time as this. Lord, our community, our city, our workplace, they need, they need to know the grace of God. But they will never know it if they don't see it in us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us as we leave tonight to remind us of our responsibilities. Lord, to be godly people in an ungodly world. Lord, I pray for the church that we will continue to thrive Lord, continue to grow. Lord, continue to be a blessing to our community and the world around us. Help us to fulfill our responsibilities in the church. And Lord, if we've ever spoken out of turn, Lord, forgive us. Lord, if we've ever had a bad attitude, Lord, forgive us. Help us to be the example. Help us, Lord, to rise above the fray of the world and, Lord, to live as God's people. Lord, we thank you for your word. It gives us instruction. Help us to obey it tonight in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Amen. Give the Lord a good hand tonight. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Before you're seated, oh, wait a minute, you're going home. Before you go home, I want you to turn to three people and say, I appreciate you and I thank God for you. Amen. Amen. Good night, everybody. We hope to see you on Saturday for Bob Roush's. Memorial. Good night.